This week is Shavuot. This holiday has special symbolism in Messianic Judaism, especially when exploring Torah observance and being spirit-filled, and plays a unique role in the story of Paul's own relationship to Torah observance and life in the spirit, as we will see in this video. First, some context about Shavuot. In Jewish tradition, Shavuot, the Feast of Harvest, commemorates God giving Israel the Torah at Mount Sinai. In Christian tradition, Shavuot, which they call Pentecost, commemorates God sending the Holy Spirit to fall on 3,000 people for the first time after Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days after his resurrection. In Messianic Judaism, we celebrate Shavuot as a commemoration of both, God giving us the gift of Torah at Mount Sinai and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, after Jesus' ascension. Many Christian scholars think the New Testament teaches that living a life led by the Spirit replaced the need for the Torah. For example, Dr. John Barclay writes this about Galatians 5.18. Galatians 5.18 amounts to saying that the Spirit will provide both moral safeguards and moral directives which render the law superfluous. We will briefly return to Galatians 5.18 later in the video, so stick around for that. But yes, the New Testament's perspective on Torah and the Spirit is complex and difficult to fully comprehend. However, the New Testament does not teach that being Torah observant and Spirit-led are incompatible with one another. In fact, they are wholly complementary and are both fundamental pillars of living a life obedient to God as Jewish followers of Yeshua. The Holy Spirit inspired the text of the Torah, enables us to follow the Torah by freeing us from our sinful nature, and sets us free from the penalties and curses prescribed by the Torah, including death. We see this dual emphasis embodied in the life of faith of the Apostle Paul. You may have heard or read that Paul's letters teach that life in the Spirit replaces a life of Torah observance, even for Jews. In this video, let's explore how accurate that claim is. In Acts 9, Luke notes that while Paul was on his way to Damascus with permission to arrest followers of Yeshua, Paul had an experience with the risen Messiah and afterwards became blind. Then a man named Ananias, who God commanded to find Paul in Damascus, tells Paul the good news and prayed for Paul to place his trust in Yeshua the Messiah, regain his sight, be immersed, and receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, 17-20 says, So Ananias left and entered into the house. Laying hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Yeshua, the one who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was immersed, and when he had taken food, he was strengthened. Now for several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately, he began proclaiming Yeshua in the synagogue, saying, He is Ben Elohim, the Son of God. For many interpreters, Paul's dramatic Damascus Road experience not only brought him to faith in Messiah Yeshua, but also caused Paul to pivot away from Judaism and a life of Torah observance. But is this true? I don't think so. Acts 21 offers an account of Paul's continued commitment to Torah observance and declared this in front of thousands of Jews at the temple during Shavuot. Before reading this passage, let's take a look at an excerpt from Dr. David Rudolph's article, Luke's Portrait of Paul in Acts 21, 17 through 26, where he sets the context for this important event. Dr. Rudolph says, in the third month of the Torah's calendar in the Jewish world is celebrating the pilgrimage festival of Shavuot, Pentecost. Josephus records that on the, quote, arrival of Pentecost, a countless multitude flocked in from Galilee, from Idumea, from Jericho, and from Perea, beyond the Jordan, to present festal offerings. That's from Josephus' War 2, 42 through 43. Paul was one of those Jewish pilgrims, quote, in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost to offer sacrifices, that's from Acts 20.16 and 24.17. Notably, Pentecost coincided with the anniversary of the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, an event witnessed by all Israel. So we know from Josephus that countless Jews would journey to the temple in Jerusalem during Shavuot. This would be a great time to make a statement about Paul's Torah observance in front of the whole Jewish community. Acts 21.17-26 says, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. 
Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So whether Paul was Torah observant as a follower of Jesus is one of the few questions that is explicitly asked and answered in Scripture. In this passage, we hear of a rumor going around Jerusalem that Paul taught other Jews to abandon Torah. James and the Jerusalem elders, who knew this rumor to be false, knowing Paul himself kept Torah, advised Paul to publicly display his position by participating in the Nazarite vow of four Jewish men at the temple during the Feast of Shavuot, where countless Jews were congregated in Jerusalem and could witness or quickly hear about Paul's public declaration of loyalty to the Torah and the Jewish people. About the significance of Paul's public commitment to Torah in relation to Shavuot, Dr. David Rudolph says, In Luke's narrative, Pentecost continues to be a time when spectacular events are witnessed among God's people. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit is poured on the day of Pentecost, and Jews from every nation under heaven witness it. In Acts 21, 17-26, Paul, surrounded by Nazarites who drew crowds because of their piety and lion-like appearance, testified in the temple on Pentecost that he remained a Torah-observant Jew. And Jewish pilgrims from around the world, including many of Paul's accusers, witnessed this public declaration. James's plan was for this picture of Paul to be widely seen and shared. Quote, Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Acts 21, 24. To hear an in-depth reading of this passage in Acts 21, and to hear a response to the counter-argument that Paul was merely acting as if he was Torah observant to become a Jew to the Jews, check out my video, Did Paul Teach Against Torah in Acts 21? Responding to Rabbi Michael Skoback. The link is in the description. From Acts 9 and Acts 21, we know that Paul was spirit-filled and Torah observant. But is this all we have showing Paul's Torah observance and spirit-filled life? Let's see how else Paul displayed these faithful qualities by taking a look at four examples from Scripture that confirm Paul's commitment to Torah observance, and then four examples that demonstrate how Paul lived a spirit-filled life. Example number one. In Acts 16, 1-3, Paul has Timothy, the son of a Jewish mother and Greek father, circumcised. The passage says, Now Paul came to Derb and Lystra, there was a disciple there named Timothy, son of a woman who was a Jewish believer and a Greek father, who was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him for the sake of the Jewish people in those places, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Number two. In Acts 17.2, we read that attending the synagogue on Shabbat was Paul's custom. It says, Paul went to the Jews in the synagogue as he customarily did, and on three Sabbath days, he addressed them from the scriptures. Number three, in addition to teaching Jews to follow Torah and circumcise their children and his observance of Shabbat, Paul and his traveling crew also went by the Jewish calendar. Throughout Acts, we see Paul continuously go to synagogue on Shabbat, as was his custom according to Acts 17.2, as we just read. Luke also uses Jewish festivals as markers of time, such as Yom Kippur in Acts 27.9 and Passover in Acts 26 and mentions that Paul was rushing to Jerusalem to be there in time for Shavuot in Acts 20.16. Number four. In Acts 18.18, we read that Paul himself committed to a Nazarite vow. It says, Paul, having stayed many more days, said farewell to the brothers and set sail to Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria, Paul had his hair cut off, for he was keeping 
a vow. Again, Dr. Rudolph highlights the significance of this act. He says, The Nazarite vow was a special act of consecration, a way of expressing one's piety above and beyond the requirements of the Mosaic law. In this regard, Paul's apparent Nazarite vow, mentioned in passing in Acts 18.18 outside of Jerusalem, confirms James's view of Paul in Acts 21, for it indicates that Paul is even more than law-abiding. He is doing more than what is strictly necessary. From these passages, we know that Paul lived a life committed to Torah, taught other Jews to do the same, directed Jewish boys to be circumcised, worshipped and sacrificed at the temple, went to the synagogue on Shabbat, lived according to the Jewish calendar, and committed to seasons where he took on even more responsibilities found in the Torah than was necessary. At the same time, Scripture offers descriptions of how Paul was deeply spirit-led. I'll offer four examples from the New Testament that demonstrate this. But first, I'd like to quickly acknowledge a possible objection to my argument in this video. Galatians 5.18, on the surface, appears to create a harsh dichotomy between being Torah observant and spirit-led. It says, But if you are led by the Ruach, the Spirit, you are not under law. For now, I just want to offer the interpretation of Dr. Todd Wilson that he offers in his article, Under Law in Galatians, a Pauline theological abbreviation, where he makes the case that, quote, there is a good reason to think that elsewhere in Galatians, under law serves as shorthand for under the curse of the law. I have also suggested that Paul probably uses the expression as a way of alluding back to and thus invoking the curse of the law as discussed in 3.10-14. through 14. On this reading, then, Paul's statement in 5.18 would be rendered as follows. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the curse of the law. So this verse isn't creating a dichotomy between being filled with the Spirit and obeying the Torah. Instead, Paul is articulating the dichotomy between being filled with the Spirit and experiencing the curses prescribed by the Torah, such as those found in Deuteronomy 27, for disobeying the Torah. An adapted version of Dr. Wilson's article can also be found in Introduction to Messianic Judaism. So try reading through Galatians with this idea in mind, that under law is an abbreviation for under the curse of the law, and let us know what you think about it. If you'd like to see a video dedicated to addressing this verse in depth, let us know in the comments below. But now let's get back to examples of Paul living a spirit-led life. First, in Acts 28, 8-9, we read of one of the many supernatural healings God provided through Paul's prayers. It says, it so happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed sick with a fever and dysentery. Paul visited him, and when he had prayed and laid hands on him, he healed him. After this happened, the rest of the sick on the island started coming and getting healed. Second, not only was Paul filled with the Spirit and prayed for people's healing, but he also spoke in tongues even more than any of the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul is reprimanding the Corinthians for misusing and abusing the gifts of tongues and prophecy, Paul says in verses 18 through 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. However, in Messiah's community, I would rather speak five words with my mind, so I may also instruct others, than 10,000 words in a tongue. Third, we read that Paul listened to the Spirit to guide him in where he should go during his travels. Acts 22, 22 through 25 says, And now look, bound by the Ruach, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Ruach HaKodesh bears witness to me from city to city, saying that bondage and afflictions await me. However, I don't consider my life of any value, except that I might finish my course and the office I received from the Lord Yeshua to declare the good news of the grace of God. Fourth, in addition to praying for people's healings and speaking in more tongues than any of the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 12, 1-4, Paul speaks of himself having visions and revelations and perhaps even experiencing the third heaven. He says, I must go on boasting, though it does no good. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Messiah, whether in the body I don't know or whether out of the body I don't know, God knows. Fourteen years ago, he was caught up to the third heaven. I know such a man, whether in the body or outside of the body, I don't know. God knows. 
He was caught up into paradise and heard words too sacred to tell, which a human is not permitted to utter. On behalf of such a man I will boast, but about myself I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. Notice Paul, in the first person use of I, claims to have visions and revelations in verse 1, but then shifts to the third person in verse 2 and describes a man in Messiah who was caught up to the third heaven. It is possible that Paul's third person use of a man in Messiah is still a reference to himself. This is what the Jewish annotated New Testament claims. It says, I know a person is an oblique self-reference following the apocalyptic convention of anonymous authorship. In rabbinic anecdotes, narrators may refer to themselves in the third person, generally as that man. The reason Paul and other Jews would tell personal anecdotes in the third person is to avoid being boastful. The Bible background commentary on the New Testament says, Because later Jewish teachers sometimes used that person as you or I, it is possible that Paul here relates his own experience in the third person to avoid boasting. Willing to boast only in his weaknesses, Paul will not accept any praise for his personal revelations. If this is what Paul is doing in 2 Corinthians 12, then he is telling us not only has he experienced visions, but he has also experienced the third heaven. Finally, in Philippians 3.3, Paul was clear about the compatibility of Torah observance and spirit-led faith. We find Paul treating a life of Torah observance, signified by his use of the word circumcision, which stands for Jewish people who, by definition, were expected by God to try to keep the Torah, in a life in the Spirit as seamlessly compatible. Paul says, For it is we, that is Paul and Timothy, who are the circumcision, who worship by the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, and glory in Messiah Yeshua, and have not depended on the flesh. So there you have it. Not only was Paul spirit-led, but he remained committed to obeying the Torah as a Jewish follower of Yeshua. Paul was filled with the Spirit, spoke in tongues, prayed for healing, listened for the Spirit's guidance, and had dreams and visions, maybe even experienced the third heaven. He was also wholly committed to Torah, taught other Jews to do the same, had Jewish boys circumcised, worshipped and sacrificed at the temple, attended synagogue on Shabbat, followed the Jewish calendar, and made Nazarite vows. While Paul teaches that not everyone will participate in all types of spiritual experiences, he does teach all Jews to commit themselves to a life of Torah. Just as we see the beautiful compatibility of Torah and spirit in the life of Paul, we also find it in this holiday of Shavuot when 3,000 Jews received the Holy Spirit and when Paul publicly declared during Shavuot that he remained a committed Jew. This dual emphasis follows what is promised to Israel in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. It says, I will put my Ruach within you, then I will cause you to walk in my laws, so you will keep my rulings and do them. If you learned something new, please like the video and subscribe to the channel and the podcast. Share this video with a friend who is celebrating Shavuot. If you have any questions or even objections, email us at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. That's T-W-O messianicjews at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. And Chag Shavuot Sameach.